Hi, Jayashree. Uh, hi, Vinay. Hi, Narendra. Um, so in terms of participation, it is going to be a bit lean, mainly because uh, I've I've personally invited no one. Uh, it's all very certain these right now. But um, uh, let me give you like a small uh, introduction about what this is about before when I takes over in terms of the content. Um, so this, uh, I'm part of Bank Pipers. I, uh, I co-run Bank Pipers. It is um, a Bangalore Python user group and uh, it's been operational from 2005. But um, we've been uh, like me, um, Anirudh and Ritesh, three of the co-organizers right now have stepped in a couple of years or more than that uh, to, you know, volunteer for the organization of meetups in line, in uh, connection with the group. But uh, it, has, uh, if it has effectively been a volunteer driven, um, you know, community. And uh, that's how it's been going on for the past 15 years. Um, and of course, uh, it's because of uh, speakers like Vinay and uh, many, many more before him, and I'm sure many more after uh, in the months to come that will sustain the growth in terms of participation and proliferation of uh, Python as a language, as a community, and um, you know, as a, almost as a culture in fact, right? So uh, just give me one a couple of seconds before I do the uh, a little bit of maintenance work in terms of uh, sharing this on YouTube live and stuff so that you know people can access it. I wonder if I can. Uh, okay. I think I can't. Mm, I can't go YouTube live because it's not a live account, but that's all right. Uh, I'm going to upload this later on our YouTube channel, uh, which is here. Let me just. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about you know what uh, Vinay is going to talk about today and then we'll start but even before I do that uh, what is the purpose of today's gathering right it's a weekday why do we why are we doing this now is it typical it's not so this is the first of uh, the up and coming set of webinars that we intend to do. Um, I say it as a, I say a webinar because this is not going to be a discussion of sorts. It's going to be when I talking about uh, secure applications using uh, Flask or in Flask. Uh, so, or secure Flask applications actually. So um, that's what a webinar is. One person talks about the topic in, um, and uh, we get to learn from it. Uh, we intend to have some fireplace charts later as well in terms of discussions. Um, but more commonly what we do is we have meetups and workshops on the third Saturday of every month. So consequently on the 21st of this month, we will be having a meetup with uh, three or four speakers talking about anything they've done in Python. So for the people watching this and for the participants here, I think almost all of you are new except for Rahul, Hai and uh, Vinay. Um, that you know, uh, if you have any any talk to present or any workshop to give in Python, anything that you've done, uh, anything you want to talk about, feel free to reach out to me or any of the other co-organizers. Um, and today, what is Vinay going to talk about? Right, he's going to talk about web application security with secure.py and a little bit about HTTPy as well. Uh, I think we are all, at least in this forum, aware of Vinay's. Uh, uh, interests in terms of technology and how he's dabbled around in a lot of stuff. Um, so yesterday when I asked him, do you have anything you want to talk about? He said, yes, I want to talk about uh, security in Flask and we didn't even bat an eyelid. So thank you, Vinay. And uh, I felt comfortable asking him like that because he's already given a six hour Flask workshop in the past. right? So I think uh, that's where the confidence comes from. Anyway, I think we've given enough context and set the stage and also Vinay, the rest of it is yours. You can share your cool. screen. Yeah, I am going to do that. Uh, and you know what? Uh, I said it's oh, a It says uh, host disabled uh, screen sharing. Did I? Oh, right up. Yeah. Let me enable it. Um, so, uh, you know, because, uh, and I've said you know a lot of times in this, I should like cut back on the idiosyncrasy there, but uh, 
uh, I think given the number of people we have, given that the less uh, the number of people we have is very less by design, um, would you be welcome to taking questions in case people have questions in the middle? Yeah, yeah? definitely. All right. Definitely. Uh, cool. Okay. With that in mind, um, when I Please go ahead. I think you can, you yeah. should be able to share your screen now. Yeah. I want to mute yeah. myself, yeah. stop my video. Yeah. Anyone has a question, please uh, right. feel free to put it on the chat. Yeah. I mean, if there are not many people, they can also unmute themselves. All right. So today's webinar is going to be about uh, a very small thing called secure.py. And it is also about tools around secure.py. So the, ma the main purpose of this talk is to help people understand more about uh, how your applications can be uh, exposed to the internet. When you, when you create a Flask web app, it does not even need to be Flask, by the way. When you create any web application, how does someone with some uh, evil intention go around looking through your application? Because remember, when you, have a, when you have a web application, the only thing somebody can do is use curl or they can use your web page. So let's say google.com, for example. So let's, let's say curl google.com. What, did, what do I get? I just get some HTML. It tells me something. It tells me uh, in the title, it doesn't even say Google. It just says 301 moved. But there are ways to see more about this. What, what is this information actually? So if you use the curl has options like so. So you can say curl hyphen yes, hyphen D space hyphen. I'll explain all this later. So what this happens is this shows additional information about your request. This information is very important when you're making a request. Every API, every API that you've ever used, every website that you've ever used will be exposing uh, will be exposing these things. So these lines, this, the way this entire thing is structured, this is the HTTP protocol. The HTTP 1.1 protocol defines a HTTP response as plain text, by the way. All, whatever you get is always plain text, but it, it defines it as plain text with some headers at the top. It gives the HTTP version, the, the status code, and it gives some additional information. And we'll get to this in a bit later. After this, it, there is one blank line, which is extremely important. And then you get the content that you're responding. If this had been a JSON, for example, all you would have gotten is you would have gotten the same thing with the JSON over here and some additional metadata information here, which tells you that you're dealing with a JSON. Now, what happened? So this entire, uh, out of this, what the most important thing that you should be looking at right now when you begin is this. You see this 301 moved permanently and you also see that there is a 301 moved here. So does that mean when there is a 301 moved permanently, it will always, the title will, of the page will always be 301 moved? Not necessarily. The, remember, this and this, is both done by the same are both done by the same developer but they do not need to be the same what that means is the developer does not need to exactly follow the guidelines these are guidelines http status codes if you look for them if you look for a cheat sheet or something all links are available in a post i'll be sharing later when so I, if you just look at some yeah sorry can you just speak a bit louder or towards closer to the mic the puzzle Oh, the mic is right here, actually. Thank you. I'll, I'll try talking a little bit louder. So yeah, uh, HTTP status codes. These are the recommended HTTP, HTTP status codes. However, people can misuse them. Whenever someone says, like say, uh, whenever, some, whenever something responds saying 408 request timeout, somebody could actually spoof this. They could spoof this information and they could return something else. The reason I'm going into HTTP headers first is because HTTP headers are the most under, under studied item when you're studying how to build a web API. When you're building a web application, you the, the part that you're dealing with is usually choices between are you doing it in Rails, Flask, Django, Fast API, maybe Java structs or something. And uh, uh, or so you have different choices. Those are the choices you're making. However, the choices you should also be making are what headers am I exposing? What status codes am I using? These are extremely important. So for this, for example, let's say I want to try spoofing this website. If I want to spoof what is given here, it is fairly simple. All I'll need to do is, uh, actually wait, I'll type it anew so that people can see. So you say import Flask, an application is a, a very simple Flask app. 
flask and you say you just pass it under name as usual and you say app dot route oh sorry at app dot route and you say slash and def index yeah let's copy this for example right let's copy this and let's say return response i'm just doing this and i'm saving it as app2.py okay i'm saving this as app2.py now i already have a virtual environment here with with just flask just the basics nothing special so here what i can do is flask app is equal to app2.py and i say flask run after i say this one second now that application is uh, that application is running on uh, localhost 5000 all right so i'll curl localhost 5000 so this returns me the same response you would the response is exactly the same however let me see what the headers are the headers are different these are the headers i'm getting here however if you remember correctly the headers i got from google were completely different these were the headers now let's see what if i want to spoof this header if i want to return this 301 e uh, in itself in the response i just say return and 301 and i run it again here i get this 301 mode permanently so this all the developer had to do was just change this so this is to show you that the content inside the body of the hair of the of the response of the api response does not really need to have a need to do anything with the actual headers this is point number one but why are these headers important so there is there are a bunch of standards or guidelines when it comes to http headers there, there is this foundation called the ovasp which is the open web application security project so they put out a bunch of guidelines with respect to if you are building a web app if you are going to be building a web application if you are going to be exposing it to the internet or to any serious number of customers what are the kind of guidelines you should be taking what are the kind of uh, what are the precautions you should be taking especially with regards to uh, certain things like how do you test your application? What kind of headers do you uh, what kind of headers do you install? Uh, how do you expose your application and uh, such and such forth? However, the main po point of today's top uh, today's discussion is this particular thing. This is called the OWASP Security Headers Project. So this project has some guidelines about the response headers. It what it essentially says is if you are going to be exposing your API to the internet, make sure that your headers comply with these. So it has it has about 10 guidelines which you can go through. I'm not really going to explain much of these. The point that I would like to make is these headers, they can be added manually. So you can go ahead and there are there is a way like if you, uh, you the flask has a concept of hooks. So you can say after request, you can say uh, after request and def uh, headers. Uh, this takes a, a response and respond you can return the response and if you want you can look into the response and print it you can print out the response and uh, see what it does so here if i look in if i relaunch my application oops All right. So I have I have a response here. So if I want to look into how how do I get my headers? So it has a it has an object called headers. So again, 
I'm not uh, enabling live read or reload on purpose, by the way. So here, if you look at the headers, it actually prints out the headers. It says content type and it says content length. It had, it had the, these two other headers. The server and date are not exposed here. They come later. But let's say, now, let's say I want to add a new header. I want to say response.headers.set. So this is how you had a header. So I say test and I give a value of one, two, three. All right. Now, look at this. I just added a header over here called one, two, three. Now this test one, two, three, it's up to the browser and the UI application to actually do something with these headers. Otherwise, there is no point in really adding headers. You can go ahead and add any kind of header you want. So, uh, so it doesn't really make sense unre unless your front end, uh, uh, front end supports it. And it also doesn't make sense if it is not standard. The, however, there might be some special use cases or specific use cases your application has. However, look at these headers. So these headers are standard response headers that the OVAS project recommends. So it describes these response headers and it, it says this is how you should put them. This is why you should have them like say, cross-site request forgery, for example. When, uh, let's say you don't want your API to, API's requests to be spoofed between domains. So if you don't want it to re respond to requests which are coming outside of its domain, uh, so you can do that. Or if you don't want it to respond to project, uh, responses which are coming from uh, unauthorized hosts, you can even add, so headers go both ways, by the way. Headers not only come in the response, they also go in the request. So when you make a curl request, when you make, so let's, I will actually, uh, yeah, let me do this. So if you look at the man page for curl, one second. So curl supports, it supports both response headers and request headers. You can add request headers. You can actually say, uh, what kind of header do I want? Because if you remember, uh, if you have looked at how authentication works for applications, basic auth is just uh, nothing but a uh, BR64 encoded request header. It just goes along with the requ uh, request header and that, that is added to the request so that when the application gets it, like if you used in Flask, if you could have seen this, right? Uh, you have an object called from Flask import request. So this request object that you have, where is this coming from? So you can print request. See this? When I print the request, I got this request. So this is the request which is coming from the other side. Now this request has headers too. that had headers too. And what were the headers? The headers told me which host it came from, the user agent, and the uh, and some other metadata that you would like. So these headers on both sides, usually they're a way for the browser and the backend to communicate. When I say browser, I also mean curl or uh, any, any other command that you're using like this. So th they're es essentially ways to add additional information to the response body or to the request body. Now, uh, it is really, see, it is, it is up to the developer. A responsible, a responsible developer will probably be uh, stringent enough to add all of this. There are different ways of adding these, by the way. You can add them directly. You can hard code them into your application, like how I've shown you here. Or you can also do one other thing. You can set these response headers automatically using your load balancer. Usually what happens is you have a web application like Flask, you have a Flask application. Your Flask application is being served by something. I'm not going to go into this right now. It is being served by something. And this something is interconnected to a, uh, to a web server like Nginx, a load balancer, or you can use it, uh, you can use Apache. Uh, but both of those, both of those, any web server worth its weight is going to be able to allow you to add additional headers to your response. And many of them actually do this by default. The moment you add your web server and reverse proxy or essentially your Flask app like this will be running on port 5000 or something. 
it will be running on port 5000 and from 5000 you want to expose it to the internet through the ssr to the 443 port or through the port 80 if you want https or without https you want to expose it to these so in the middle you have your load balancer or your web server which is going to do this for you and what it usually does is by default it will add uh, some additional headers so that that request gains a, another layer of information this is good information like this this is telling you see this is telling your customer this is telling your user that your back end is running something called workzeg and it is also running python 3.8.5 both of these are good information to have however there is a there is a caveat it is also bad information to have you do not as long as you trust your customer, as long as you trust your customer to be uh, like, let's say you're making an API, only your colleagues are using in your team. It is a very limited five people or six people. It is fine. You don't need to be bothered too much. However, let's say you're exposing this to the internet. You do not want to expose what your backend is on the internet. The reason why is all it will take someone is, let them look at this, for example. Let's say Python 3.8.5. All you search for this. We need to figure out what kind of vulnerabilities uh, Python 3.8.5 has. Figure out what vulnerabilities I can I can hack in through. I'm not saying I'm not saying this will be like a movie where I just find something and I'm able to hack into your application. No, but it could be as simple as some memory fault which could bring your service down. That is enough. All I would have to do is run some. I'll have some for loop inside which I'll put a curl command. I'll be hitting your API with a certain response body. And if that response body conforms to a security flaw in Python 3.8.5, that is it. Your service is going down. Uh, there are many ways of doing this. However, the point is not how you can hack a service, but how you can prevent uh, slight precautions you can take to prevent these from happening. So the first thing you should be doing is stripping this data. You do not want this to be there. So instead of this test one, two, one, two, three, let's take server, for example. Server, and in server, I'm just saying NA, not applicable, that's all. I'm just doing this. Yeah. One moment. All right. So, look at this. Instantly, my server, server information is gone. There may be other ways that the user can guess how, depending on what your HTML looks like, they can probably guess what is at your backend, by the way. Uh, there are telltale signs, but, that, but right now we're not going to look at it. We are just assuming that instead of, instead of this body, let's assume you're returning a JSON. Let's say you're returning a hello is equal to some, some JSON which looks like this. So now you have this, by the way. You got this, oh sorry. So you got this response. I got this response and th that is fine. I have all of this for me. So now uh, the, with this response, I can't really guess what is my backend uh, for now. Now let's say there are some, the, you may have also seen this. If you have coded in Node, Node uh, has this library called Express which does this out of the box. What it does is x powered by express some 1.5 or something. Let's say this, okay. Yeah, it just says uh, x powered by something. This is additional information telling you what framework this is running on. This is well and good, this is good advertising. However, it is also bad advertising. This is the kind of inf information you don't want on the internet. You do not want to expose uh, what your web server is running on, both the language and the exact framework that you're using and on top of it, the exact version of the framework that you're using. This could be good information if you're running some automated tests to bring down your application. Like sometimes people do that. They do measure, uh, they do measure the resilience of your applications. And if you're internally testing it, it might be good to have this kind of information. However, on a public facing service, you should not be exposing any of that. Now let's go back to this. What does, so these guidelines that the uh, OWASP project gives us, these ten, the 10 of them, you could go ahead and keep doing this for all of them and you would have a nice snippet of code you can copy and paste everywhere. 
or you can use the Pythonic solution and you can just install a library called secure.py. Uh, the name of the library everywhere is called secure.py so that it is Googleable. Like you can just say Python secure.py. However, when you pip install it, the command is secure and even when you import it. So in my virtual environment, I've already installed this library. So I'm, go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and try using it on this. So now, If you go here, you can see that this library only has this much. There's nothing else really to be honest with you. This is a very small file. If you have used web.py anytime, web.py is the library which eventually became Flask in a way. So if uh, that library was also like this, it was a very tiny file. Everything was in one file. Eventually it became so big that they had to split it between files and stuff. However, the concept is you should be able to copy the content one file and keep it with you. But if you want, you can always pip install it. So when you do this, what happens is, let's take this for example. Let's not look at cookie for now. Let's just look at response.headers. So I'm using say uh, uh, from secure import secure headers and look at how you install it for Flask. If you come down, it's up, these are all the frameworks it supports. So what does secure.py do? So out of the box, the secure headers part of secure.py it takes the OWASP security headers projects guidelines and it adds every single one of the uh, the recommended uh, the recommended header into your response. Uh, so it adds the server information. It nullifies the serv uh, server information. It enables strict transport security, X frames. So it enables all of these. So you can go into each one of these, but they're all the top 10 from the OWASP security header project. One moment. Huh, where did I go? Uh, mouse is being very Yep. So let me go to Flask, yeah. Again, by the way, this supports Django out of the box. So if you're not like me and you like Django, you can always go ahead and try this. I'm actually surprised Django doesn't have this out of the box. Hmm. So all you need to do is add this. You need to add your headers using this. Secure headers .set. Uh, secure headers is a object that you need to create. And that's it. Look at this. This has instantly added a bunch of information to your uh, request. It has added, so the server is already there, the sub uh, strict transport security, X frame options, X, uh, uh, cross site uh, pro request protection, all of this. You have all of this stuff out of the box for you. The reason uh, this library exists is essentially this, it, because this might be a little too hard to remember or you don't want to be bothered with it. Not everyone wants to have in-depth information knowledge of what Sec uh, what security headers are and why we need them and how we follow them and everything. This is a blanket simple library. It's a very simple library. This is all there is to it, by the way. Uh, you just take this and plug it in. There are different ways of doing it. Again, go back, go back to the help. Go back to the help and see if you're running Django. That's all you do. You just add middleware to the Django request to every response. You just say security headers the Django and that's it. Here it was Flask. And essentially, this is it. This library, this, the, we confirmed to the guidelines with a very simple addition to our code. This could have been a massive Flask project, by the way. And naturally, this does support, you can limit the scope of this. Let's say you have a blueprint. If you have a blueprint here, say core is equal to Flask dot, uh, sorry, blueprint, uh, no, print. When I, we are at the 30 minute mark, we have 10 minutes. Yeah, I'm done essentially. 
I'm just uh, lengthening this thing by adding blueprint. <laughs> so you can say uh, co op name or something, and then you can go ahead and do at core core dot after request. So this would be essentially only for that blueprint, this part of it. So this is actually nice. It follows a very Pythonic way of doing it, and it is native. It's nothing special. All it does is when you do this. It knows how to set the headers for this library and it sets it on. Now, so I've been using I've been using curl for this. Curl is a very nice. Uh, I like curl for many reasons. However, curl looks like this, and you need to remember uh, curl's options by the way. So you need to remember this. So this actually uh, says uh, show me all the headers, and this says. Uh, Print it out as a string and all of that. But if you don't like doing this, there is a nice library you call HTTPy. HTTPy is a very simple uh, Python-based tool. It is essentially like a command line uh, Postman. If you use Postman, it is a command line version of it. So HTTPy gives you a very nice. Uh, oh, sorry. So, HTTPy is installed using pip install HTTPy, but you use it as HTTP. HTTP, let's say google.com, it instantly, by default, it prints out the headers for you. It, uh, it gives you pretty nice colors. It prints out all the headers for you because it knows that you might probably need all this information. Now, let's say I'm the local host 5000, instantly. And it also knows how to print out a JSON neatly. So it does that as well for you. So this is how you use HTTPy. So HTTPy also has additional information. You can add, like if you say, uh, let me do this by the way. Uh, so, ah. Uh, So you can add headers. You can add, add headers easily to this. So localhost 5000 and the way you add headers is some docs. Yep, you can just say this. Let's say I want to spoof uh, something. So I can say, no. Oh. user agent is equal to Mozilla or something. So if you go back to your or the original terminal, this was printing, ah, yeah, I should have printed this. See this, it adds, the user agent. You can easily add, adding all of this information, like you can add header information. If you had basic auth, you could say authentication. Authentication, and you can put a double quote or a single quote here, basic, and you can give the basic auth string, and that's it. It does all of that. And if you wanted to add additional information, you can just say hi is equal to 10. And yeah, this tried to do a post, by the way. When I it instantly. Uh -huh. uh, Rahul asks, um, this was a question for the previous section, but can we check the size of the HTTP headers when running it with and without secure.py? Huh, yeah, like uh, you want to know the total body size. Well, to be honest with you, it is the size of the string. That is all it is. Because HTTP is just this. No, uh, the thing is, hey, I'm out of Hey guys. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. There's some yeah, uh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, the thing is like, there's a size limit with different uh, web server, right? Yeah. So Apache has like 8K. So uh, is there any uh, difference with when, it, when, it, uh, when we're using uh, increased number of uh, uh, like headers that when we're passing that? So I, I just yeah, wanted to uh, yeah, have it as an experiment. Be, yeah, that's a good question, actually. I didn't think about this. The header should not really be uh, adding too much size. 
because remember like i said this is just plain text since this is plain text all you would need to do is uh, let's say you have this okay you have this you write it out to a dot out and du hyphen sh a dot out and it was a 4k response that's all it is it's just a text file whatever whatever this gave you whatever the entire response this gave you like a dot if you say uh, cat a dot out can you curl it oh yeah, yeah yeah let me curl yeah, it yeah you can you can find it to its curl right yeah 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 look at this so this and du hyphen sh a dot out so yeah four kilobytes that's all it is so this uh that, so if you try without if you want to try without this right it should not be that much of a difference let's say i i remove this and i remove this yep 4k not much of a difference because that's all it was right it wasn't much it was just a little string the actual problem that comes out will usually be your json so what then you need to do is there is a library called flask bzip flask uh, yeah no uh, flask gunzip or something it's called something so yeah flask bzip so what this does is it'll uh, it, it takes all your responses and it'll make sure that they are compressed it adds an additional header and it makes sure that uh, so it, it's a nice library if you ever want to worry about oh, okay. Yeah, it's like minification of CSS. All right. Oh, thank you. Yep, I'm done. I can take more questions. Yeah. Hi, hey, when I Krishna here. Yeah. Uh, oh. I have one question. Say, for example, oh. so uh, this is fine when you are uh, sticking to pure, uh, say, a Flask or a Django-based application that you are exposing. But in yeah. general, that I have seen is what you have is you will have either a HA proxy or an Nginx in front, yeah. which actually redirects to the backend applications, be it yeah. in the Kubernetes world or oh. uh, any services where you will have a, yeah. a load balancer uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, or rather, I'm a little confused on. Uh, whether uh, you or at least you know of cases where you would either harden that or harden the backend so within the org i think you know wherever you are hosting it be it within your cloud environment or within mm -hmm. the organization yeah uh, uh, i mean it can be open i mean uh, everyone knows what uh, framework you are using yeah. uh, but to the outside world probably you would not want to expose any of these and so exactly uh, you would harden or I would prefer to harden the, um, say, the proxy exactly. uh, over exactly. the backend. Uh, yes. Any counters to that argument? No, there are no counters to that argument because that is agnostic of the language. I I would not. I would actually recommend doing it that way. So this is nice as long as it is a tiny application you are writing on your own. Let's say you have you have a lot of microservices, and some people are writing in Java, some people are writing in Python, some are writing in Rails, whatever. So this library is pretty nice when you're doing it for a tiny library, uh, one single one-off uh, API. However, if you're going to be doing it across your org with many microservices and everything, and you want to add these headers for everything, always, always do it with your uh, HA proxy or Nginx or Apache or whatever. That's the easier way because all you'll be doing is since you'll, uh, even in a worst case, you'll have a huge, uh, let's say, let's assume the worst case scenario where your Nginx conf file is some 600 line file. Even then, uh, you can add your for all the responses in that file you can easily add uh, the headers in a single place because remember what happens is let's say i do this okay i say i do this and then you add nginx on top of it i'm pretty sure nginx will start adding server information on top of this so the you've lost the purpose you lost the essential purpose of doing secure headers ah oh, yeah the krishna was saying uh, wouldn't it be better to just use uh, headers on the engine load balancer side? And I totally agree. I actually think that is a better idea. Okay. This is essentially for uh, knowing that you can see if you're going to be deploying hundreds of thousands of web apps, you should be probably doing that. Even if you're doing more than one, actually, you should be doing that if you have the same load balancer because you might forget to update one or the other. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're going to be writing just some a small flask apps, a flask apps for your own purpose. This is a very simple way of getting out of it. So, uh, how would this scale? Like, if if you had to have the best of both worlds, how would you use this in production? 
could you uh well you could use see if it was production right if it was production i would recommend the way krishna recommended mm. uh you have a load balancer you have a big nginx config file and with that nginx config file or some this thing you could add you could add your headers everywhere right. or yeah you could do that you could do that you, you can write some tiny script which adds all of this uh nginx takes lua or is it lua or lisp i don't remember what it takes lua I lua i think it takes lua yeah, lua so you can write it in you yeah, have for somebody already has this you search for nginx ovasp and you'll find some 500 configs right uh, so you can use that that would be very easy to use so yes ah nginx comes built in with ovasp uh, prs okay it has some i think you have to pay for this though i'm not sure if it is in the yeah, nginx plus yeah it's in the nginx plus it's not in the uh, the open yeah. source one yeah but it does that if you're yeah, if you're in a big enough company you can pay for this and you can get this done this yeah. solves all of your problems for you so cool. it even does uh, yeah yeah it even uh, oh so it also spoofs the user agent from the client side request it's nice so you can't have user agent based uh, behavior mm. if someone is using curl do this if someone is using mozilla do that yeah that's nice <laughs> i don't know why you would want to do that but yeah makes sense Yeah, I mean, admittedly, uh, my security knowledge is very less. Like I am. Uh, oh, so here's the thing. I found an amazing book. So I'll rec- what I'll do is I'll feed back to this blog post I made, especially for this uh, this for uh, this meeting. Hmm. But uh, so I found I was recommended this book by a security architect I know. Hmm. Uh, it's called Secure by Design. It's by Manning, Manning Publications. Right, uh, the entire it. book is available online for free. Uh, Manning has this thing where you can read all their books for free, but their text is obfuscated. You can't run curl or wget to download their books. It's kind of nice, actually. Nice. I mean, they're using their principles. Yeah, using sure. tech. Yeah, using tech to this thing. At least they're making it free. You can read it on a tablet or a phone or whatever. So this book is really, really nice. It teaches about all of this. I learned all of this from reading like first few chapters only. Hmm. it starts off with uh, how you should have security driven design and how uh, how you can make sure that your application accounts are security from the ground up so it's a pretty okay. good book. so this kind of stuff is very important when you're writing code for a big org which has a lot of security guidelines or stuff right i mean security based decisions are uh, i think important mm-hmm. it, it's a bit sad that it's not driven into our uh, learning oh, yeah. culture i think First time I ever found out about see uh, the cross site request thing, I disabled it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Why is this there?" The I minor want... annoyance. Ah, it was a huge annoyance to me. I was like, "No, I'm making this request." Yeah, there'll be there'll be like a big pain when you first start yeah. the React app or anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. When you're building your first React app, it is a huge pain in the ass, and you just disable it. You're like, "Let's disable this thing." Now I'm happy. I can make my request from anywhere. then later you learn about all of this and you start thinking how do i enable this i think it also speaks to a journey in development right like you you yep. practice on your own local host and your own servers so there it doesn't make much of a difference right it doesn't it's not important um yep, yep, i design so i think that's why you don't focus on it and i think things never go into deployment at all in the learning stage oh yeah but when you do that's when you realize the importance of it and you don't pay more attention to csrf oh yeah definitely all cool, of these I, things so this i think you yeah, know this, uh, web, this website is gold by the way uh, it has it has guidelines it on the chat on, i think have uh, you can you post it on the about, chat yes i will i'll actually do one thing i'll shamelessly post my blog article because it has all the links good enough good enough uh, And on that note, I know Akshay just joined now, but uh, we will wind up. Sorry, uh, sorry about that. No, no, <laughs> sorry okay. for your. I mean, like I'm sorry. No, no, no. Akshay <laughs> says sorry for everything, by the way. Oh, okay. If you know him, yeah, he, his, his hello is sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll wind up. So what this has been is like a primer in this webinar journey that Bank Vipers has undertaken. Uh, we haven't done this before and it's nice to know that it works as a proof of concept and also we've had a nice discussion not a discussion a nice webinar about uh, when i talking about uh, security right um and actually i welcome anyone else who is uh, even remotely 
uh, knowledgeable or if they are just experimenting with some stuff and they want to discuss about what they are doing, um, we can have like a webinar of sorts or a discussion of sorts uh, in that journey and we can, you know, collectively um, learn some st stuff. Um, and uh, I intend to have this every two weeks or at least every month, uh, apart from the third week, weekend sessions that we have for workshops and meetups. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Vinay, for joining on such short notice yeah. and for giving us a nice talk. And thank you all for joining. No um, uh, I think an audience makes the talk, right? Uh, uh, even otherwise, I was actually planning to have this be published and have it be viewed later passively, which, which would have been perfectly fine with me. That's what that was the design. But um, Vinay wanted some of his friends to join and I'm happy that it's turned out the way it has. Uh, so yeah, again, thank you all. I think we'll wind up. No, and unless uh, I have like one um, like a thirty second thing, if anyone wants to say anything, ask anything about bank papers. I'm Abiram, by the way. I'm an engineer at uh, a company called Ona and Solutions, and um, we have two more co-organizers, Vipesh and Anirudh, and the three of us are currently hosting this little group um, for organizing. And yeah, any questions, comments? Right. Hi, I am. I am a Vic. Yeah. Yeah. So I usually came to know about bank pipers through uh, Twitter, like way back, and I joined uh, Stone Chariots. I guess uh, the uh, first session on uh, Flask. Oh. So okay. like after that, like you know, uh, I usually always like you know, I will just uh, yes, I will. Join, I will join, and then every other Saturday I will just forget. But today I I just uh, saw that uh, Twitter post and like I just rushed in and um, but it actually helped me a lot. So like uh, I would suggest that uh, if it is possible, always keep on posting these uh, Zoom links in Twitter every other week, like whenever you have a uh, these kind of meetups and all. Sure, for sure. Uh, I think this was ad hoc and it was um, almost unplanned. Um, but yeah, we will. What we are very wary of are these Zoom bombings that happen. I don't know if Zoom has increased their security by way of allowing hosts to admit or not admit people. Um, but uh, we will post it in the future or at least give, a, give people a heads up, right? I think this one by design it was unplanned and uh, by design it was um, not, uh, people were not invited beforehand. But uh, I intend to do it going forward, and uh, we'll keep people posted so that you know you, you can plan your day as well. I don't, I did not expect uh, even two or three people to join at this time as you guys have. So thank you again, um, Avik. Thank you for that uh, feedback. It is important and it's useful. It's ha it's good to know that people will join on a weekday, man. I did not know that will happen. So well, happy. everybody is at home right now. We have nothing else to do. <laughs> right, what is the day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, what is day? All right. Good. Thanks, everyone. Happy Thank Diwali, you. by the way. Yep. yep. All right, guys. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.